Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm sorry about the way the previous video um, ended. Uh, for some reason there was a max time of 15 minutes set while I was recording the video. That's why it abruptly ended and um, so I want to continue where the previous video ended. Uh, we were talking about introduction to association rules and um, although we might not be able to cover association rule analysis in a lot more detail um, but I just want you to be familiar with what association rules are and where are they typically used. Association rules help you come up with these um, if-then statements that are going to tell you the likelihood of certain items being purchased together. Now this has plenty of applications in the supermarket business or even in the grocery store business. Um, you can f The grocery stores can use their point of sale transaction data to identify which products are usually bought together and then that helps them, that relationship helps them um, create strategies for designing the layout of the grocery store and which products should be placed close to each other, which products should be placed far apart and so on. So decisions like th those can be made using association rule analysis. Um, a very popular example of association rule um, in action is that um, it was uh, it, it was used in 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 a, a research by Walmart. Um, I'm I'm not sure if this was this is a hundred percent correct, but this example has been used in a number of um, text blogs and textbooks uh, that Walmart was able to identify that there is a relationship between the sale of beer and the sale of diapers. So what they found out from their research was that fathers who shop for diapers also pick up beer, which is why um, they moved the beer aisle close to the diapers aisle and that helped with the sale of beer tremendously. Now um, this is just an example of how association rules can be used but the general idea is that there is an antecedent to the rule which means that these are the items corresponding to the if portion of the rule if a customer buys diapers and then there's a consequent uh, which corresponds to the then portion of the rule then he will buy beer so uh, based on this if-then statement, you can devise strategies or help plan out the layout of your grocery store uh, depending on how accurate this rule ends up being. So that's uh, the only uh, sort of um, time that we're going to dedicate to association rules because uh, we have to cover all these other models that are also a part of data mining analysis um, and we're going to focus more on clustering analysis which is going to be covered in a separate video that I will upload um, but after that we're going to move on to predictive uh, data mining techniques. So the predictive data mining portion starts from slide 29 onwards and what you'll notice is that on slide number 31, uh, there is sort of an overview of all the steps that are uh, followed in a data mining process. Now, although this is under the predictive modeling portion of the lecture, but keep in mind that these steps are um, common to descriptive data mining techniques as well. So you would have to carry out these uh, steps in a consecutive fashion uh, even for descriptive data mining techniques and in, in this uh, introduction video 
uh, we're going to talk about these five steps, uh, specifically the portion on data preparation and data partitioning. And then um, I will end this video, but uh, we're going to cover the predictive models that we need to study in slightly more detail, like logistic regression, KNN, they will be covered separately. So um, in this, in the remaining portion of this video, I'm going to talk about these five steps that are involved in any data mining model um, that you create. The first one is data sampling. Now, usually when we're working with data for a data mining model, it's sort of given that we have access to a lot of data uh, because data mining is only meaningful if you are applying it to a large amount of data, um, essentially big data. So um, for in, in the part of data sampling, even if you have access to the whole population of data that you're working with, um, usually we have to test out the model on a smaller segment or a smaller sample of the population just to make sure that the model fits the data, it can be applied to the data, and it works properly. So once you've determined that, it's easy to move on from the smaller sample to the bigger sample, um, to the bigger population of the data, if you're not adding additional dimensions to the data. So for example, if I have data on the demographics of my current customer base, I may have uh, information about their household income, uh, the average age in the family, how many family members are there, um, the level of education of the parents in the household, um, the age, I have already said that, uh, sorry, the age and gender of the family members. So we might have all of this information about our customers, but just because of the fact that we have in this information doesn't necessarily mean that we have to use all of this information in our model. We only need to use the attributes that are important to the objective at hand and the attributes which make sense in, in the model structure. So if the age of the customer uh, doesn't have any theoretical sense or any um, intuitive sense to be in the model, we don't have to put it there. So in, the, in essence, we want to sample the data in a way that we're only keeping the attributes that we need for the modeling purpose. The second step is data preparation. Usually when you are um, dealing with data in a classroom format, uh, the data has been structured nicely and given to you. It's properly formatted. There are no missing values. There are usually no horrendous outliers that you need to detect. So uh, basically you've been given data that has already been prepared. But in the real world, when we're working with real life data, that may not be the case all the time. So there's a lot of effort that goes into preparing the data in a way that it's correctly structured and format to be applied to your model. Um, and that takes a lot of time because you have to look for um, flaws or errors in your data set that you may not even know exist. Uh, this could include missing values, this could include outliers, this could include uh, reducing the dimensions of the problem by getting rid of unnecessary attributes, just like I mentioned earlier, or um, it could just simply mean using a smaller sample of the data that you have at hand. So all of these are a part of the data, data preparation stage. Uh, you need to decide what is the correct format of the data for you to be using in the model, depending on the software that you're using for the analysis. You need to decide what you're going to do with the missing values. If your sample size is already small, you don't want to get rid of the missing values. Instead, you want to um, use as, as a proxy, something as a proxy for those missing values. It could either be the average of the whole data set or you could use the nearest neighbor to replace that missing value. Um, so 
those are the decision kind of decisions you'd be making in the data preparation stage and sometimes we also may have to transform the data in a way that is applicable to our model so for example uh, when you cover logistic regression uh, you will notice that we are transforming our uh, our data and creating a new variable altogether called the logit function that we use um, in in the logistic regression model eventually so that variable does not exist already in the data set instead we have to perform some mathematical operations to create and um, produce that transformed variable to be used in the model. That also is a part of the data preparation stage. Uh, the third step is data partitioning. Now a lot of the times when you start off with a data mining analysis we are not sure in the beginning uh, whether this model that we've decided to apply to our data set is appropriate for the data set or if it's going to uh, reap results that are accurate enough for us to use. So for that same reason, we divide our data set into three partitions. The first partition is called your training set. The second partition is called your test set. And the third partition is called your um, validation set. I'm going to come back to the data part partitioning portion in a little bit uh, just after I cover model construction and model assessment. Um, so the fourth step is model construction and that's where we basically take our prepared data, put it into the chosen model and then run the software or the algorithm um, to construct the the relationship that we have identified between the different variables and finally in model assessment um, we use our test set and our validation set from step three to gauge how well our model has performed in terms of the accuracy and in terms of the prediction of the results now um, i want to spend a little more time on the partitioning of the data set and why it is important. So the partitioning is important because uh, as I mentioned earlier we're not exactly sure if the model is a good fit for our data set. So we want to be able to test our model on values on, on the values of the data set that we know uh, the true values for. So for example if I take my same example of sunglasses uh, sales and the temperature in that model I have two variables the temperature in the specified range of summer days and consequently the sale of sunglasses in those days. Now um, I may have 10,000 rows of data values in my data set and I can run the regression analysis on the whole 10,000 rows, but a better way would be to partition my data set into three um, sets, the training set, the validation set, and the test set. So what it does is basically I'm going to uh, take out a portion of my data set that I know the actual values for and keep it aside so that once I create my model I can test it out on those values and check how well my model performs on unseen numbers. So uh, the training set is usually the biggest partition of your data set. Um, the general rule of thumb is 70% of your data set is your training set because you want to keep a bigger sample for training purposes. Um, so 70% of your data set you keep aside for training and that's what you create the model on. Um, so the regression equation would be derived using that training set. Now if I test my regression equation on those training set values the results are bound to come in the favor of the model because it uses Use the same training set to get those values. So uh, a better test would be to test my regression model on the validation set and the test set because the regression model has not seen those numbers yet and hence we will be able to uh, 
check the accuracy of the regression model or any model for that matter um, in in a more uh, logical and clear way uh, as opposed to testing it on the training set itself so there sometimes you might not even need a validation set you could just have 30% of your data as your training set or 80% of your data as your training set and then the remaining 20 or 30% as your test set to do the testing and test the accuracy and prediction of the model or if you're comparing multiple models and you want to select which model is better than the other and then test the selected model um, then you would need a validation set so the validation set is optional it you don't have to have a validation set all the time but if I have three or four regression equations that I want to test um, and compare to each other then it makes sense to have a validation set uh, compare my the accuracy of my results of the validation set of three regression models that I'm comparing for example and then finally once I've selected the model uh, out of those three equations I can perform the test set and see the prediction of the values in the test set so um, it completely depends on um, the type of analysis you're doing but generally there is always a training set and a test set sometimes you have a training set a validation set and a test set so the validation set and the test set are actually smaller portions of your data set so for example a 70 15 15 rule can be applied where 70 percent of your data set could be training 15 could be validation and then 15 could be test so I'm going to um, stop here for the for this video um, and then uh, you can refer to the rest of the material for each of the models that we're going to cover in detail. Uh, namely, we're going to focus on clustering analysis, logistic regression, um, a couple of other classification techniques such as regression trees. And then finally, uh, and obviously KNN, K nearest neighbor method. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how do we test or measure the performance of the model that we just created. Um, so please refer to the rest of the material for those subtopics.